I want you to imagine that you are in a distant and dangerous land and you need to take a journey but you don't know the way you don't know how to get there now you have two guides in front of you and they each offer you their services the first one says don't worry I will get you there no problem it's gonna be easy you'll have a great time with me and you probe a bit further and you, you ask them oh have you ever been the way I want to go and he says well I've never been that way but I've led other expeditions and I'm sure it will be fine you will have the most comfortable and enjoyable journey with me the second man stands before you and he's got scars on his body he looks weathered and beaten and he says there is no comfort to be had on the journey you're about to take I can get you to where you're going but it's not going to be easy there are parts of the trail that are treacherous and hard and many have fallen there and many have been lost on this path you are going to be in danger you may even get hurt but I know every inch of this trail every pitfall and I know how to get through them all I will get you there which guide are you going with the upbeat positive one full of promises or the guy with the scars you go with the guy with the scars right you go with the guy who knows the way you go with the one who has been through it many times and knows the, what lies ahead the one who knows the hard parts and knows how to get through them only a foolish person would say I want to go with the first guy he said it would be easy and I want it to be easy but the trail is the trail neither of the guides made it hard they didn't make the danger it's just there so don't you want to go with the one who is who is not in denial about that danger don't you want to go with the one who knows the danger who knows how to deal with it who's already been through it our lives of course are that trail it's full of dangers it's full of things that will hurt us full of events that will make us sad episodes that will injure frustrate and grieve us who can we trust to lead us through it who is the true ruler who is it safe to follow you see there are many voices claiming to be able to lead you through your life various religions there is the voice of money and fame and academic success and career all promising you they will get you through but who is going to be able to navigate all the pitfalls of life who's going to get me to the end safely which one do I pick how can I know who the real ruler leader is how can I know who is the real God? How is it possible to sift through all the options of different religions and different gods? Well, the living God himself sets the real test for any religion and any gods who would claim to be real. In Isaiah 41, he says, simply prove that you know the way. Prove you know the way ahead. He says, set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs let them bring them and tell us what is to happen tell us the former things what they are that they that we may consider them that we may know the outcome or declare to us the things to come tell us what will happen in the future that we may know that you are gods the living god lays down the gauntlet to all these other false gods the false guides that make all these promises about life these gods who promise they can get you through it keeping you healthy wealthy and happy and he says fine prove it prove you are able to do it by telling us the future prove you know the way tell us the things that will happen and then we will believe that you are reliable guides of humanity seems like a reasonable test doesn't it but it is is it's a reasonable test 
But is it one that the living God himself can stand up to? In the next two chapters, we're going to see in startling detail that indeed he can. In chapter 8 and 9, the living God shows that he knows the future, that he can get us through it, and that he even has a plan for it. So let's get into it together. So this vision happens two years after the last vision we had, we had two weeks ago, um, the last sermon in Daniel, that vision of the four beasts and the Son of Man riding on the clouds. Daniel has another vision concerning the nations. And this dream, we're told, is still in the reign of Belshazzar, the Babylonian king. And in this dream, he sees a goat and a ram fighting. And across the dream, we have various numbers and types of horns growing on these animals and falling off these animals uh, and all that. Now, even if Gabriel hadn't spelled out for us in the second half of the chapter what this is all about, you probably already understand much of the imagery. Because we're starting to get our mind into this ancient Near East mindset, aren't we? We see these same motifs coming up again and again. And so we're used to understanding that these animals are different nations, aren't they? We know that horns are these images of rulers. And we are used to already the, 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 the two rulers that are lopsided, that, that ruler of the Persian Empire, like that lopsided bear. We're already used to this, uh, this image of one that becomes four of the Greek Empire as Alexander the Great dies and his kingdom is divided between his four generals. So we already know, don't we? We already know that this is about the Greek Empire defeating the Persian Empire, about Alexander dying and his, king being, his kingdom being divided. And so the question is, why are we getting this motif again? Well, first of all, notice this, and this can become really important as we apply this passage later. Previously, I have told you that the silver chest is the Persian Empire and the bronze waist is the Greek Empire because that's obviously what it turned out to be. But here, in the scriptures itself, Gabriel tells Daniel by name, this is the Persian Empire, this is the Greek Empire. And remember, this is significant because we're still in the reign of, of Belshazzar. We're still in the Babylonian Empire. This empire that was so strong that even, even when the Persian Empire was on the rise, that night we've already read about, when Belshazzar came under attack, he just had a party. He was so sure that his defences would hold. There was no expectation at this time that Babylon would fall. And yet Daniel knows ahead of time exactly what is going to happen. Daniel sees and records events that wouldn't happen for 350 to 400 years time. You see, this isn't just a prediction. This isn't just good guesswork. This is Daniel being shown events that have not happened yet. In fact, these prophecies are so accurate that many modern scholars assume that they must have been written after the events. Because how could these events be known in such detail in advance? So we get this motif again of Persia and Greece, but there is this new focus in this vision. It isn't on the creatures themselves, but on this one horn that grows up. Daniel 7 is... Daniel 7 that we had two weeks ago is not really about Babylon and Persia and Greece. It was about the powers behind those empires and behind every empire that raises itself against God. And so we saw the Lord God dealing with that monster last chapter. But now, after the cosmic vision of Daniel 7, the Lord zooms in on these two nations battling, but they're not by a vast sea but along a single canal. And then he zooms further in onto this one singular little horn, this one ruler. The first thing Daniel sees is a ram with two horns 
charging to the north, south and west. And the two horns are unequal length because of that union between the Medes and the Persians that was an unequal alliance, just like that lopsided bear. The ram of Persia was strong though, and it had great success. But a new challenger would come from the west, a goat. It did not have two horns, but one mighty horn. This is a prophecy about that mighty ruler, Alexander the Great, who would make extremely rapid conquests uh, a crot on his eastward journey. Do you notice the goat? Like, it doesn't touch the ground. It's like kind of flying. It's going so fast. And the goat easily defeats the ram. Just as the, per- the Greek Empire would so easily defeat the Persian Empire. And just as the one great horn of the goat was replaced by four lesser horns, so after the death of Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire was divided up into these four sub-kingdoms. As we read in verse 9, out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. And then in verse 11, it became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. So one of these four horns of the Greek Empire, becomes really big, takes over territory that belongs to the other horns in the south and the east, and then it says it turns its attention to the glorious land. This is speaking about Israel. And then this ruler does some terrible things in that glorious land, which meant that the sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem had to stop for 2,300 days. It's very clear from history that this horn is a symbol of the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Antiochus IV was a brutal king. He began his reign as the king of the Seleucid Empire in the year 175 BC and he died in 164 BC. Over the course of those 11 years of his rule, he gave himself the title Epiphanes. Now we might recognize that word Epiphany from the Feast of the Church Epiphany, which means God manifest. So during his reign, he gives himself the name, I am God manifest. I'm God on the earth. And during his time, he heavily persecuted the Jews. Antiochus was very successful at war for a while, and so he took most of the Sinai Peninsula, uh, but he, couldn't re- he found it really difficult to get into Egypt and conquer Egypt. And so when he tried and failed to take Egypt, he blamed the Jews, because they were not participating in worshipping his gods. And so because they refused to worship the pagan gods, Antiochus decided that's the reason I'm not being successful. Because there are people in my kingdom who are not worshipping the gods, and so the gods have not given me success. And so whenever he kind of lost a battle, he would brutally take it out on the Jews. And so in 168 BC, he marched on Jerusalem, still seething with anger after his failed conquest of Egypt. And he goes to Jerusalem and he goes into the temple and he goes into the most holy place and he puts a statue of Zeus in the Holy of Holies and he sacrificed a pig on the altar. The most, like, kind of, the the way you could most desecrate the temple with, with this animal that's unclean. And he did many other terrible things in the temple, which you can read about in 2 Maccabees, but I'm not going to say right now. He didn't destroy the temple, he didn't knock it down, but he desecrated it to such a degree that it could not be used for the worship of the living God. This act was called the abomination of desolation, because it was abomination to God, and it left the temple desolate, uninhabited, Now, there were people in it all the time. Pagans were doing all sorts of vile things in there. But God left. It was desolate because God had gone. 
And you'll remember um, from Palm Sunday that it was after this, you remember we talked about this, it was after this that the Jews reclaimed the temple, that they performed that day of atonement ritual with the palm branches, and that's where the palm branches become a signal of victory and cleansing that are then used on Palm Sunday. So Antiochus was brutal and he was evil, but it wasn't just that he was cruel to people. He set himself up against Jesus. He called himself the revelation of God. He claimed to be a God, defiling the temple and rebelling against Jesus. But Daniel tells us he would last only 2,300 days. And that roughly turns out to be exactly how long he lasted. Depending which sources you look at, exactly how long he lasted. And verse 25 tells us that, he won't, that his, his rule will have an end and he will die by no human hand. God will deal with him himself. And indeed, that is what happened. And um, you can go and read about it in 2 Maccabees chapter 9. It involves sickness, um, him falling off a chariot and breaking all his bones and then just erupting in worms. So much so that no one's going near him. And he just dies this slow, torturous, uh, oozing, swollen death. Um, much like Herod did actually we read about these men who set themselves up against God God deals with them so that's Daniel chapter 8 now after that explanation of Daniel chapter 8 you might think well Doug that sounded more like a history lesson than a sermon and yeah kind of did didn't it I agree with you but that's kind of the point you see because we can't understand the purpose of chapter 8 in our own lives unless we first understand what it meant to Daniel and the original readers and hearers of Daniel. The lesson of Daniel 8 will not be apparent to us until we understand that there are some very real and specific things that happened in history and Daniel knew about them, some of them up to 400 years in advance. How? Well, because Jesus told him about them. You see, the living God satisfies and fulfills his own challenge that he laid down in Isaiah. Where he said, tell us what will come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. He shows that he can do just that. The living God of Daniel knows exactly what is going to happen. He does know what the future holds. And so... He can lead his people through it. Nothing takes him by surprise. God knew the future and he revealed it to Daniel. Now, as we have seen, Daniel's not written chronologically, is it? And that makes it very interesting reading. Because we see Daniel interpreting everybody else's dreams before we even find out he has his own dreams. And so in this dream, Gabriel comes to him and he gives him the interpretation in a lot of detail. He tells him it's Persia and he tells him it's Greece. And so when Belshazzar sees that writing on the wall, which we saw in chapter 5, I think, it's really no surprise that Daniel is able to give such a strong interpretation. Yeah, this is the Medes, this is the Persians, this is what's going to happen, then it's going to be Greek. He knew what was going to happen because he'd already seen it. And notice, what does Gabriel say to Daniel in verse 26? He says, seal up the vision, lock it away. It's not for now, for it refers for days, many days from now. The fact he's told to seal it, what does that tell us about the purpose of God's foreknowledge? Because... I wonder if things ever happen to us and we think, God, if you could have just have told me that that was going to happen, I would have done things differently. If you had just told me that's what the future held, I would have made sure I did something different to avoid that hard thing happening. If Daniel had allowed to, if God had allowed Daniel to warn Belshazzar, then he could have done any number of things to try and avoid being destroyed. But God said, seal it up. Because God doesn't reveal the future in order to improve our immediate circumstances, but to give the church confidence in his leading 
and his rule. God doesn't say, this is going to happen, so do this and do that and you can avoid it. He doesn't say, this is going to happen, so do this so that nothing hard has to happen to you. No. He simply says, I need you to know that I know what is going to happen. The future is not unknown to me. It may take you by surprise, but I know all about it. So, walk with me, and I will show you the way through and the way out. Last time, we saw Jesus defeating sin, death, and the devil on this kind of cosmic scale, didn't we? We had the earth, we had the heavens, we had the ascension. But God doesn't just know about world history in this general sense. It's not just that he knows that, well, it'll work out in the end and we'll see what happens on the way. Jesus here demonstrates that he knows every step along the way. That's why he can lead us so well. That's why he is the true God of gods, the true Lord of lords. He knows every twist and turn of history. He knows every twist and turn of our lives. There is nothing that will happen to you or that has happened to you, that he doesn't know about. To go back to our opening illustration of the two guides, um, I'm sure you picked up it already, that second guide is Jesus, isn't it? He looks a little beaten. He's got scars on his hand and his side and his, his brow. But that's because he knows the path. That's because he's walked it already. Jesus joined us. He became one of us. He walked our path right to the bitter end through heartbreak and loss and persecution and oppression right to the end, to death and the grave. He walked our path. He is the leader who knows the way. And so he can get us through the end. The first guide is every other offer of leading you will, you will face in this world. It is the world, it is the media, it is money, it is politics, it is academia and the experts, it is medicine and science and technology, all these things that promise so much. They promise if you just have enough of me, if you follow me, if you just commit your lives to me, if you earn enough money, if you get the right qualifications, if you have the right medicine and technology, then your life will be good and comfortable and there doesn't need to be any suffering. They promise they can keep us safe and get us to where we want to go. But they don't know anything. They don't know anything about what tomorrow will bring. And so, of course, when the unthinkable happens, when life closes in and we are abandoned and ill and abused and alone, of course, they have no real answer to our problems. None of their promises hold up. We just look around and the world is full of rich Wealthy, qualified people who are sat in their mansions surrounded by their tech and their fashion and their comfortable lives. And they are miserable. They are chasing the next thing. They are depressed and lonely and broken. And yet in this very same world there are men and women and boys and girls who have nothing. But they have Jesus. And they are full of joy and life and comfort. There are monks who have given up everything and spend all day in prayer. There are children who are hungry and poor but who have the bread of life. There are people in war-torn and persecuted parts of the world who are imprisoned simply for following Jesus. They are locked up and tortured and yet we hear reports of them they are full of hope and joy because they know that Jesus will bring them through it and into his everlasting kingdom. All the ways of this world lead to disappointment, but Jesus knows the way to life. He has made the way to life. He is the way to life. He says in John 14 verse 6, doesn't he? He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. There is a leader who can get us there. There is one who lives. And if we follow in his way, if we obey his commandments, if we avoid the dangers he points out to us, and if we commit ourselves to him, he will get us through. You see, Jesus is the way to the Father. He is the way to real and full life. This is important to remember because as you look back on your life, you can probably think of things that have happened that were bad. But we've already said God knows all the things that have happened and he knew about them. So how do we process that? Why does God allow these things to happen? Let me just close with this. In his dream, Daniel sees a time when the temple is desecrated. In in chapter 11 of Daniel, we're going to hear this time called the abomination of desolation. Now, that's a phrase that we've already heard this morning, isn't it? In our New Testament reading, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, When you see the abomination of desolation, spoken by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, and he puts in brackets, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, hang on a minute. Because at this point when Jesus says this, Antiochus is already in the past. He's already happened. So why is Jesus speaking about the abomination of desolation as a future event? Well, because something very similar is going to happen again in AD 70, when the Romans conquer Israel. Roman general Titus is going to come to Israel, enter the holy place, and have a statue of himself put up there. And then he's going to destroy the temple completely and for good, such that it's still in that state today. You see, Antiochus becomes this paradigm, this picture of Antichrist. Remember, we said Antichrist is not a single person, but there are many through history who stand up against Jesus and try and take his rule. And so, if you want to imagine what an Antichrist figure would look like, think of Antiochus, who calls himself God, who kills and tortures God's people, who defiles the temple of the living God. He is horrendous. He is wicked and cruel, bloodthirsty and perverse. He is just as wicked and evil as any modern dictator you can think of. And yet, the Bible tells us he is just a little horn. That's all he is. In the grand scheme of the world, he is nothing but a little horn on a goat. Yet for those Jews who lived under his reign... Those 11 years must have felt like the end of the world. But it wasn't. I want to be very careful when I say this because our sufferings are real. And they are painful. And they are sometimes very, very long. Sometimes an entire lifetime. And I don't want to, for one moment, minimise the pain that we experience. But I do want to maximise our vision of Jesus. You see, we might want to say, so, so what if my suffering is 10, 20, 30 years? So what if in the grand scheme of things the, the world is short? To me, that's a huge proportion of my life. But is it? You see, our lives are not 70 or 80 years and then they're done. Our lives will go on into eternity. And they will either go on into eternity with Jesus, into life and joy and love, or they will go into an eternity of death and hell and misery, cut off from Jesus. And the question is, which one do we want? Which one are we pursuing? Which leader will get us to that eternity of joy? Because it is only Jesus who will. We know how the story is going to end. Jesus has already shown us that in Daniel 7. And he's provided evidence that he knows that that's going to happen in Daniel 8. And so if we know, and by the way, Daniel 9, it's going to blow your socks off next week. 
because he tells us how he's going to do it. It's quite startling. And so if we know the end, if we know how it's going to end, we simply have to ask, how can I live today? How can I face the sufferings that come to me today in a way that will make me ready for that end? How can I see my life not on the scale of the next 50 years, but the next 5,000 years, if we can kind of put it that way, or longer into eternity? How can I use my sufferings to draw me closer to Jesus? How can I make every one of these sufferings mean something and worth something? Because our lives are going to be filled with antichrists, people and powers and events that want to tear us away from Jesus. And so it's up to us how we respond to them, whether we make them bring us towards Jesus or whether we let them tear us away from him. Are we going to kind of feel sorry for ourselves and say, well, this isn't fair and spend our days wishing it were different? Or are we going to respond in a way that brings us closer to Jesus, that trusts him to lead us? Are we going to respond by turning to prayer, by practicing repentance, by fasting and confessing and seeing all that we have in Jesus that actually we don't deserve? Remember, our guide bears the scars of this life already. He's not removed from our sufferings. He's been through them. Hebrews 4 tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus bears the scars of this world and so will we. There's no escape in that. So will we. Because that is what it looks like to be a human following God in this fallen world. The world bites us and burns us and leaves its marks on us. There is no avoiding this. The world is a wicked place, but its days are numbered. 2,300 were the days of Antiochus, and in the same way, every evil that is ever allowed to arise against us is limited. But the way of Jesus, the way of the Father, is eternal. And so commit your lives to him. Jesus says to you, the path ahead of you is fraught with danger. You are going to get hurt. But follow me and I will go with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing will happen to you that will not also happen to me. You will never face any of this alone. I know the way. And if you follow me, I will bring you safely into the eternal life and presence of my Father. In chapter 8, Jesus proves that he knows the future. And if you thought that prophecy was exciting, come back next week for what is one of the most precise prophecies in the Bible that tell us the year that Jesus will be born. Daniel is told the year that Christ will be born. We'll hear about that next week. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.